Okay, so we're going to start today with a cloud computing tutorial. Can I just get a quick show of hands? Um, who has worked with cloud computing, AWS, GCP, Azure? Um, okay, and so this will kind of um, help me pace the tutorial. Um, if you want to follow along, uh, I have the outline for the tutorials on the GitHub page. Um, so you won't be using JupyterHub at all today. Um, hopefully not. Um, and you would need to have either the terminal on your uh, MacBook open, or you would have to have um, something called Windows Bash or Putty. And if that doesn't, and if you don't have that, then we can revert back to the Jupyter Hub because we have a terminal in the Jupyter Hub. Um, yeah, so that is the link up here, uh, github.com slash oceanhackweek. Tutorials, um, day four cloud, if you want to follow along, there are lots of um, commands there. Um, that I will be using throughout the entire tutorial. And please, if I'm going too fast, please, please let me know um, on Slack, uh, or you can just raise your hand. All right, um, so I will be talking a little bit about the cloud, um, why and when we should use the cloud, and how we use it um, in the context of research, and then um, towards you know, 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll start doing some hands-on tutorial. So what we'll be learning today is basically how to provision or get your own virtual machine, which in this case for AWS, it's called an instance. Um, we'll be, we will also be learning about how to store data files and getting them on and off the virtual machine that you have provisioned in the cloud. Um, the other thing we'll be doing is creating something called machine images, which are basically just snapshots of the system that you have set up so that when you stop your machine, you can go back at any time and restart it and you'll get the exact same thing that you created. So it'll make more sense as we go through um, the tutorial. So in the context of research, why use the cloud? There are basically six advantages um, to using the public cloud. And when we talk about the public cloud, it's everything ranging from Amazon Web Services to Microsoft Azure to Google Pl Cloud Platform and even to um, the systems created by um, science foundations like Exceed, um, the NSF Exceed. Um, so you don't wait for a compute task to begin. You can start your compute at any time. So that's one of the benefits. The second benefit is that you don't need to maintain your own hardware. So if you're familiar with the old system administration um, way of uh, running clusters or servers is that you have to upgrade the machines at all, you know, periodically you have to upgrade um, not only the hardware but also the software. Um, and with cloud, public cloud services, you really don't need to deal with that. Um, and you pay for resources that you use, and so it's a pay-as-you-go method. So you don't have to spend, you know, three or four thousand dollars for one server up front, you just pay for as much as you compute as you use. Um, it's also a huge scale-up potential. Um, so it means that instead of you know, being limited to the three servers that you've bought five years ago, you're able to have multiple um, servers, or as in this case in the cloud, it's called virtual machines. You can have multiples of them, up to hundreds, up to thousands of them if you want. Um, and there's a huge support community. Um, there are foundations that are solely dedicated to helping you um, migrate your work to the cloud by building open, open source software, and um, they have high standards of how you can build pipelines in the cloud. Um, and, the, and the last thing of why you would want to consider using the cloud is that they just keep making new stuff. They have tons of services. Um, for example, now they've come out with um, services called serverless computing, where it takes away the need for you to actually have to run those virtual machines or those servers, and all you do is write your code and deploy it on the cloud, and everything is taken care of. Um, but there are also reasons not to migrate to the cloud. So the cloud is not you know, the one-stop solution. Um, if you've already identified um, a lot of um, pipelines that are adequate to your current needs, and you really don't have the time um, to, to take you really don't have the time or want to learn about using the cloud, then maybe the cloud is not the best solution for you because there is a learning curve to the cloud. Um, and sometimes you already have grants for things like Exceed and you just want to keep your work there. The other thing is that um, 
you operate your computers at very high duty cycles. So what that means is that you are running your program nonstop, 24 hours a day. And so if you balance out, the, if you calculate the costs, the cloud might not be the best solution for you. Because again, the cloud is a pay-as-you-go um, service. And if you are computing you know, memory-intensive programs um, all day long, um, based on what we've calculated, the cloud might not be the best solution for you. And also, there are things like administrative drag. For example, if you work with HIPAA data or you work with FERPA data, which is um, data that private, private, contains private information, um, there are lots of um, cases where your administration will not allow you to move data to the cloud um, due to security reasons. So um, again, the cloud framework is that cloud is an utility. You pay for the resources that you allocate. And cloud instances, or in this case, a virtual machine, can be turned off and on um, as you need it without losing any information. And this is what we will learn in the hands-on tutorial today. Um, and again, it's good to remember that on the cloud, your virtual machines or your servers are not pets. That you have to change your mindset from that machine that sits under your desk where you give it a name and you baby it and you change rate drives and you update software from year to year, virtual machines in the cloud are like cattle. If they die, you take it back out and you do whatever it is you do with cattle. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, um, um, it's, you know, there, there are a bunch of them. If one goes away, you just spawn another one up and they come back and it's the same thing. It looks exactly the same like the last cow that you brought out back. Um, so. But there are, there are, again, like I said, there are learning curves to getting on the cloud, getting started in the cloud. And there's two things that I would really like to stress when you think about moving your research to the cloud. One is that um, there are lots of ways to have um, problems occurring um, when you, for example, I'll just, this is a story. Um, for example, we learned about GitHub. And we learned that you know you can commit a whole bunch of stuff. It's great. GitHub is a way, a good collaborative tool. Um, you do some work, you git add, you git commit, you git push. But sometimes, for example, like when Rob does his um, notebooks and he uses a package called or a library called Bodo, it connects to the AWS service using something called keys. And if you commit that entire notebook with your keys in that notebook it goes onto GitHub. And the keys are a way for somebody to use your account to spin up a bunch of instances. So for example, people that are nefarious could use those keys to spin up multiple instances to mine Bitcoin. And so when you go into GitHub and you say, oh no, I've put my keys on there, I'm gonna delete this commit. But there's like a bunch of other commits that you've done with those keys. And so those are things to think about when you move to the cloud. And the other thing is to manage cost. Sometimes you forget, as researchers often do, because we're so busy, that you spin up all these instances and you're, they sit there and they're running and you don't remember to turn them off or you have you know, um, collaborators that do the same thing and they spin up all these virtual machines in different, but we're gonna learn about something called regions and they spin up all these virtual machines in different regions that you can't keep track of. And so you, that, so you have this problem of runaway costs. And so that's something to keep in mind about. And also, um, the other thing that is really important for researchers is to try to find ways to avoid vendor lock-in. So today we will be learning about um, AWS specific. Um, there are other cloud platforms out there and a way to avoid vendor lock-in is by using a lot of open source software. So for example, on Amazon, their equivalent of Docker um, is called uh, Elastic Container Registry. And there are open source ways of dealing with that. For example, Kubernetes, right, is the open source equivalent of Amazon Elastic Container Registry. So just broaden your horizons a little bit to avoid having to be in, on one specific cloud. Okay, um, and so that's basically the cloud introduction. 
Um, and we're going to move on a little bit to kind of dabble in what I just mentioned about um, instances of virtual machines. Um, we're going to create AMIs, and we're going to put files and download files from something called object storage, um, which on Amazon, the name is um, S3. It stands for Simple Storage Solution. The equivalent on Google Cloud would be something called um, Google Storage. And then on Azure, it's Microsoft Storage, Azure Storage. Yeah, so it, it, there's, all clouds have something equivalent. Um, but the fundamental thing about cloud computing that you need to know is compute and storage. And so across all three of the public clouds, they have equivalent compute and storage. Um, and we're going to learn how to do that. So again, the GitHub um, tutorial page, if you want to follow along, is on this link, um, and I'm going to paste this in Slack. And each of you should have an account um, to sign into on um, Amazon. If you were to register for an Amazon account, you would need to put in a credit card number. Um, but for the purpose of this tutorial, we have set you up with accounts that you don't, so that you don't need to put in an, um, a, a credit card number. Again, I've pasted all the information on Slack in case you missed that. Um, and I will pull up the other. So just a couple of um, terminology to help us um, orient our minds. Um, one, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, should I bring that up again? Oh, it's not on the slide yet? Oh, here it is. Okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, sorry. Never mind. Um, okay, again, here. Um, and... Um, your username would be OHW, so remember to append OHW to everything that you do, um, along with your GitHub username, which in this case, for me, my GitHub username is Amanda-Tan, so I'll append OHW Amanda-Tan. Um, your password when you log in is Ocean with um, capital HACK, week 2018, and you will be prompted to change your password when you log in. Um, but we will walk through the steps again. Sorry. Yes. Yes, um, sorry, uh, this, yeah, um, we will walk through this actually. So um, let's just backtrack a little bit and um, walk through this as we go along. Um, so why do you, why do, should I care? Or why do I care about learning about the cloud? Um, if you're learning to use the cloud, you will need to manage cost. And so we'll talk a little bit about this as we go along. And managing costs means terminating those instances, as I mentioned before. So this is also something that we will learn on this, in this hands-on tutorial on how to terminate your um, instances, but also to be able to save a copy of that so that it never goes away. Um, and how you can spin up those instances, again, like recover that virtual machine that you have um, without reinstalling everything. And so um, we're going to do something called freeze drying, which is just basically creating a machine image. And again, um, to reiterate, why AWS? Because we have credits, we have money. So when you decide on where or what cloud provider to choose, um, one of the things that we get asked very often is which cloud provider should we go for, right? Um, each cloud provider offers a wide range of services. But generally, the rule of thumb is if they offer you some kind of credit, go with them. Um, okay. So, and also, again, um, just a plug. Uh, Rob and I are here. Um, if you're at the University of Washington, or you can always drop us an email, and we're, we're glad to help you figure out your cost or which cloud um, um, to move to if, if you are so inclined. So again, logging into the AWS console um, and creating an EC2 instance, um, the account ID or alias would be UWE Science, and then your IM username would be OHW 
GitHub username. And the password is Ocean Capital Hack Week 2018. I'm going to pull this up right here. And some of you might have problems logging in. It just means that I need to create um, a new user for you because sometimes I mistype GitHub usernames. So if you can't log in, please let me know. And if you've logged in for the first time, it will prompt you to change your password. So please go ahead and um, change your password. Please don't forget your password. Once you're done with the password, um, you press, sorry, oops, am I going too fast already? Um, please let me know if I'm going too fast. If once you're done changing your password, you'll be brought to this page. Um, Login details. Again, if you're ha having problems, please put a yellow sticky and someone will come around and help you um, or just start yelling really loudly. Yeah, he's there. Drew Snaufer is there. Two S, two S. Uh, yes, two S. Right? Is that correct? Maybe that's not just 
get him. Oh, sorry. Dude, that would get help from over here. It's not working? Okay. Anyone that's having problems, could you please um, put your GitHub username on the uh, yellow sticky that Rob's carrying around, and he will set you up with an account? So just let me try it again. I just reset your thing. Good? Okay. Um, is there anyone else other than Aaron? That would be great, because Aaron can just be able to check it. OK. All right, so if we're all in, great, excellent. Um, we are going to move on. OK, and you should ha see a screen that looks something like this. Is that you? Oh, sorry. You just have been funny. That'll work. Okay, thank you. All right, okay, so let's move on. Um, all right, so again, third time. Um, you will be able to see a screen that looks something like this, and if not, if you see um, something that looks without the EC2, this is what we want to do is to launch a virtual machine under build a solution. And we're going to click on it. OK. And you should see a screen that looks like this. So I'm just in, yeah, sorry. Oh, um, just one second. Just want to make sure that everyone launches their instances in the region, Ohio. Um, there's a reason for that. It's because it makes my job easier when I want to delete your resources. But otherwise, um, you would want to choose the region that's closest to you. So for example, we would always want to choose Oregon because it's the closest to us. Um, what the regions actually mean are the different data centers that the cloud providers have. And when you choose a region that's really far away from, say, a collaborator or from yourself, um, there is some small latency, and then there's some difference in the way you, you're, you get charged for certain services that you use in the cloud. So, but for this purpose, for this, um, for the Hack Week, we would launch everything. All your services would be in Ohio. Um, so you want to make sure that um, this little thing here says Ohio up here. And we are going to scroll down, and we are going to select the Ubuntu server. And Ubuntu is just the operating system. So if you scroll down, you'll see that you are actually able to create a machine with different kinds of operating system. Um, but for our tutorial, we will be using the Ubuntu server. And if you select, you will be taken to the next step, which is to choose an instance type. And we will choose the smallest instance here, which is the T2 micro. Um, but just very quickly scrolling through the instances, you can see that they have literally, I don't know, 50 machines that, that are different sizes. And so again, this is one of the great things about the cloud is that you are able to choose any of these machines, obviously, if you have the budget for it. 
um, but there are GPU machines, there are machines with high RAM, there are machines with high CPU, and you can actually choose, you know, yes. The T2 Micro is actually free for now, um, up to uh, a certain amount of bandwidth that you transfer, and then once it becomes burstable, then it's, they start charging you, but it's a really small minimal amount. Pennies, yes, yeah. Um, and we can walk through, yes. That's a, very, that's a very good question. So if you have a current pipeline that's already built, for example, like you're running um, a program on your laptop um, and you have a knowledge of how much RAM you're using and how much CPU you're using, um, you can kind of say like, okay, I want a machine that's this large and AWS has a calculator that you can put in, you know, the number of hours I'm, I'm thinking I'll use, right? So for example, like I'll be running my program for eight hours a day on an instance that's a C4 large, which is like 50 cents an hour. So it's kind of a rough back of the envelope calculation. Um, and then also there are things um, like attached volumes that help you calculate. So one of the neat benefits of using the Google Cloud, for example, is that when you start you know, selecting the machines, um, they have little numbers that pop up telling you how much to estimate that you'll be using. So that's a, that's a very intuitive way of letting you know ahead of time how much you'll be spending. But yes. Oh, but if you are thinking about like putting the amount in a grant, for example, um, there are ways to do it, for example, like again, like I said, using an online um, calculator provided by the cloud providers, or you know, f if you're at, at the UW or even not from the UW, um, there are people like Rob and I, whose job is to help you figure these things out. Um, so yes, and Rob has something to say. That's why you don't want to put your keys on GitHub because somebody can run a $16 hour machine for five days. And yeah, and so just an anecdotally, the reason what, what happened was that um, this person was working with R and as R has history of all the commands that you've done, and the code was in that R history and he pushed it to GitHub and within just a matter of minutes, somebody found that key. Um, yeah. So, okay, all right, moving on. Um, okay, um, we're gonna hit the next button. So we're gonna select the T2 micro and because we're not gonna mine Bitcoins. Um, we're our, and then we're gonna configure instance details. And so the next page will look something like this. Um, you can basically leave all the defaults. Um, the only thing you would need to change would be something called the IAM role. And what IAM stands for is Identity and Access Management. Um, so because Amazon realized that people tend to push their keys to GitHub, they wanted to avoid this problem. And um, what they created was something called IAM roles, which allows your Amazon services to talk to each other without using keys. So for example, if you wanted to provision an instance that could talk to an S3 bucket, and S3 is the data, is an object storage um, service, you wouldn't need to use the keys. You would use something called IAM role. And here I've created an IAM role. Um, one second. Uh, is everyone else getting this error? Okay.
just one second. Crisis UOB agreed. Oh, okay, if I start it over, it works? Okay, great. Okay, just go back to choose an AMI. Okay, all right. Okay, again, if you go back to choose an AMI, go through the steps again. Um, we'll be doing a lot of this. Um, and then configure instance. Oh, yay, all right. Um, it's there. So you want to choose OHWS3 full access. Yes, so CloudNot is uh, somebody was building a bunch of um, batch services. Okay, um, so OHW S3 full access, and this allows your instances to talk to S3 without the need for a key. Okay, yes, I am Lowell. Uh, click the arrowy thing, and then OHW S3 full access, and um, everything else you can just leave it as is. And we're going to move on to add storage, which is the next step. And we're going to resize your storage to 25 gigs. So again, um, just as a reminder about good practices, um, root drives are always, I wouldn't say always, but are usually only for um, software, operating system stuff. Try not to put data on your root drive. Um, if you need a data volume, create one, and then use um, some Linux system admins um, procedures that you can easily find online um, to mount that volume that you created to your machine. Um, but for this tutorial, we are not going to do that. But just reminder, try not to put data on your root volume. Um, and then, yes, the root drive will have, yes. And sometimes you would need something for example, if you need to create Conda, um, if you need to install Conda, you might want to have a bigger root drive, mostly because you would install Conda in your root drive, and if you install Anaconda, it's huge. So make sure that you, you size your root drive to how much you think you're gonna install. Um, for this, we're not gonna install too much, so we're gonna keep it at 25. And next, we're gonna add tags. Please do not skip this step, because the tags is how I will trace down any runaway processes um, and delete them as necessary. So again, yes, yeah, please, okay. Um, the th first thing you want, um, the first tag would be name. So that's the name of the machine you're going to build. Um, again, you wanna tag it with OHW um, and your GitHub username. And then owner would be, again, um, OHW, your GitHub username. Okay, um, and I'm assuming that we're all okay. All right, okay. Um, and then next, we're going to configure a security group. So what a security group does is it allows access to that machine. So if some of you have used SSH or SCP, um, you would need to ha open certain ports in order to connect to that machine. So here we're opening port 22. If you're using your machine as a web server, you would probably need to open um, 443 or 8080 or 8000, um, one of those ports. Uh, but for, for today, we will just keep it at port 22, so that you can actually SSH into your machine. Yes, yes, yes. And um, just in case you're thinking about, you know, cloud security and um, how we can further um, work with this, work with secure, securing your, your instance, um, you can see here that there's um, all these numbers that are zero, zero, zero. You can further lock down your machine to only certain IPs being able to access those machines. And these are important, for example, if you're looking at HIPAA data. Um, and next, we're going to review and launch. Okay. So let me just pull the trigger. All right. Okay. Um, 
and you'll be brought to this re um, overview screen and you can just click launch. Okay, but don't run away after you click launch um, because you're gonna create a key pair that you will use to log into your instance. So you wanna select create a new key pair. And again, the key pair name should be um, OHW and your GitHub username. And you want to make sure you download the key pair because if you don't download the key pair, you can't come back to the screen and you'll have to restart everything, all, the whole process all over again. So make sure you download your key pair. Okay. And once that's downloaded, you might see something that looks like this. Um, this is what a key pair is, is basically just a bunch of numbers, um, but it translates into encryption. I guess, um, and it connects your computer to the instance. Yes, that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, and you can launch your instance after this. So once you've downloaded, just make sure you download and then launch your instance. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, Fabian, Fabian, sorry, sorry. Okay, one thing I forgot to do um, was to select an existing security group. I am so sorry. No, these things go back. You get this area, just press previous. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. Just hit previous. Yes, sorry. Okay, are we lost here? Oh, what's going so well? Just like, huh? Um, we don't have access to security at the moment. We can't create an instance right now. Um, like I, I just locked down all the permissions and so it's like, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Quickly, um, please use your back and go. Please use the back button to go to this configure security group. You would want to choose the OHW SG security group, and okay. And then you would go to review and launch. And if you try to launch, um, Just, just just, very quickly, if you try to launch it and it says, and you want to create a new key pair again, but you give it the same name, it's going to throw an error. So if you've already downloaded your key pair, say choose an existing key pair and then select the key pair that you've already created. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, it's OHW. Yes, yeah, select an existing security group and you want to select OHWSG. Yes, and then review and launch. And then if you've launched, you'll see a screen that looks like this. Green means good, red means no good. So if you have a red, something red that's on your screen flashing, please put a sticker, start yelling. Um, okay, great. And so, yes.
Okay, um, so once you have this greeny thing, um, you can click on this link that will bring you back to um, your instance. So for example, here I have my instance already running. Um, but also you can you go to it using this link on the left, EC2 dashboard. Oh my god. Um, I think we just broke one of them. Um, no, but don't worry about it. Um, yeah, if you click on that, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of machines there. Um, and there are some people. Okay, can you please, if you don't see a name on this column, please name your instance. Um, so for example, J-E-H-A-W-A-R-S-K-I. Please can you name your instance? Yeah, um, so if you don't, please. So you can see that in this column there's the name, um, and then this just makes it easier for you to locate your instance in a list that looks like this, right? Otherwise, there's no way for you to know unless you go through and click it one by one. That's the tag. Instance. Yes, that tag is the name tag that you put on your instance when you launched it. Yeah, and then you can search for it here. So for example, I can search for mine here. Um, oh, I guess it doesn't work. Um, Yes, so where you can name your instance, again, if you missed it during the tagging, um, when we were launching the instance, we had the tagging. If you missed it, you can always go back here and then use the pencil button to put that in. So for example, oh, okay, I just did it. Yeah, and Mariantina. Um, so yes, uh, you can just put your names there. Um, okay. So I will move on, um, and then please locate your instance, and we are going to try to connect to that instance. Okay, so I've located my instance, and if you click on the connect button right up here, right, it tells you this is how you can connect to your instance. It gives you all this information but there are caveats to it. Um, so what I would suggest is opening a terminal or putty. Um, okay, so, so I'm, um, hang on. Okay. So if I list the location of where I am right now, I'm actually on my home directory, um, on my computer, my personal laptop, right? And I've downloaded my PEM key, the key that you downloaded, the SSH key, I've downloaded it to downloads. So you would have to figure out where your PEM key ended up and actually go into that um, folder, right? And I would locate it. So for example, you can see that I did a list of all the files that I've downloaded. Um, and my keys are there. So if you use a terminal and you go in and you locate that, you want to change the, the permissions to that key so that it's chmod400 and then the name of that key. So some of you might have downloaded as OHW, OHW github username.pm. For me, it changed it to a text file. So you want to make sure that when you change the permissions, um, it refers to the exact name of, of the download. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people are going to be using Putty? Sorry, what's your name? Oh.
to log on. If you're using PuTTY and you are on a Windows machine, there are certain steps that you need to take. And if you can congregate over where Rob is standing, he will help you figure out how to use PuTTY Gen. Otherwise, if you're really not interested in that, you can use the terminal on JupyterHub. And you can upload your PEM key to the JupyterHub and use the terminal there. So for example, if you want to use the JupyterHub's terminal, right, you can um, upload a file. So for example, here I will upload uh, my PEM key. And I would open a new terminal. And if I list it, I will see my PEM key there, and I can just chmod ohw. Ah. Okay. okay, this is another alternative if you do not want to deal with putty. All right, okay, um, but I'm going back to the terminal because that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, are we are we are we good? No. Uh oh. Okay. Maybe we should use the Jupiter Hub. That might be easier for everyone. Okay. Sorry. Um. Let's just use the Jupiter Hub for those of you who are not familiar with the terminal. Please just open your Jupyter Hub. time we're going to move on okay if you cannot use putty please don't you don't have to install git bash you don't have to install putty please don't worry about that um, please just use the jupyter hub if you can't get git bash or can't get putty please use the jupyter hub again i'm going to walk through the steps of how you can use the terminal in jupyter hub so again, if you open your Jupyter Hub, you can upload your PEM key, right? Again, upload, click the upload button, find a PEM key. So for example, here, I'm going to select um, my PEM key, right? And you choose it, and you can upload it. Okay, and because I've already uploaded it, so it says um, overwrite. There it is. Okay, and then you want to go to new and you want to click terminal. And if you list, you should be able to see your PEM key there. And you want to just do a chmod 400 on the PEM key. So actually going forward, I'm just going to use the JupyterHub terminal. So we're just going to wait for one minute. Um, sorry, just one minute while everyone gets set up with the Jupyter Hub terminal. The terminal, the Jupyter Hub. Okay.
Okay, um, can I get a show of hands of who is not at the CH mod or who has not done CH mod? One, two. Okay, um, Don will come around and help out or, um, I, sorry to put you in the spot. Okay, somebody will come around and help you out if you're still not on, but um, in the interest of time, we are going to move on. Okay, um, so the next thing we're going to do is if you go back to your management console. What's going on? What is this on? Um, the Jupiter Hub. Oh. Oh. You can't. Yeah, it's sudo. Um. Yeah, you can't because you don't have a password. Um, yeah. So. No, that's fine. Um, well, people that have terminals. Well, but if you have putty, right? Like you have bash, it should work. Yeah. Okay. Um. Quick question: How again? Can you get a show of hands of how many people are using putty? No. Just one person. Windows. Any any like putty? Git bash. Okay, but you can SSH, right? Okay. All right. Anyone that can't SSH. That's the important thing, SSH. Okay, I, I assume with no hands raised, on one hand, uh, who's Rob, whom Rob is helping, I assume with no hands raised we can move on? Yes? A sound, resounding yes? Okay, I'm gonna say yes, all right, okay. Um, all right, so chmod, again, chmod 400, your pem key, and if you go back to your console, You would see the screen here, right? And it would say example ssh-i, your pem key, and then it would give you an IP address. Um, you want to copy that command, and then in your terminal, you would want to paste that in. But there is a caveat, which is that my pem key file is actually not just .pem, it's .txt, so you want it to match exactly. And if it all works, it you will get something asking you to affirm the fingerprint. And you say yes. Why? Why are you staring at me? Can everyone log in? We good? Okay. Um, I can't log in, so.
So we're all good. Is everybody at the screen here? Did you manage to log on? OK. All right. I'm assuming that everyone's managed to log on. You're here. You're in Ubuntu. Um, quick point. Ubuntu is your username for when you create an Ubuntu machine on AWS. If you create another kind of machine not with Ubuntu, the username that you used to log on might change. So for example, if it's an Amazon Scent OS, operating system, the username would be ec2-user. So always go to this connect thingy here and make sure that you, you are aware of the username to use when you log on. OK. All right, so once we're here, we're going to do a couple of really systems admin stuff, which is to sudo apt update, right? Um, and it's a whole bunch of stuff, sudo apt update, sudo. Um, okay, again, the command is sudo apt update. And then right after that, we're gonna do the same command, but this time instead of update, we're gonna upgrade. And if it prompts you, yes, It's going to take a while. Here, here, the next thing we're going to do is install the AWS command line interface. Um, so we would use sudo apt install AWS CLI. Again, the command is um, sudo apt install AWS CLI. And again, yes. It's sudo app install AWS CLI. So what it does is a command line um, way to interact with AWS. So from this machine, really, you can do almost anything that you can do on a console through this machine. Um, you can provision more virtual machines. You can connect to S3, which is what we're going to do right now. Um, and so we would use, if you type AWS, a whole bunch of stuff here would pop up, um, right? Okay, and so what we wanna do is to list all the S th S3 buckets. So it's AWS S3 LS. Again, it's kind of like a bash um, command. And you see a whole bunch of buckets, something called buckets, which is basically just folders um, that people, other users have created. AWS S3 LS. So, those are just the dates. It's kind of like when you list all the files on your, um, yeah. All right, um, okay. 
So what we want to do now is to create a bucket, your own bucket. Um, we would use AWS S3 MB for make bucket and give it your OHW GitHub username. So again, AWS S3 MB OHW GitHub username. AWS S3. Gah. Okay. Gah. Okay. All right. How about this? Ah. Okay. It's AWS S3 MV S3 dot um, colon slash slash OHW GitHub username. All right. Okay. And then to check if your bucket's actually there, again, use the list com list command and you would see that my buckets there um, and a whole bunch of other people's buckets are there too okay all right all right uh, we have 15 minutes left so what I want to do is to kind of show you um, how you can sync buckets and then um, go back into the console, create a machine image, and then terminate your instance. Um, and then just very quickly how you spawn back that instance from the machine image that you've created. Um, so okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna list the contents of the Ocean Hack Week 2018 bucket. Again, it's AWS S3 LS, but this time it's S3 um, colon slash slash Ocean Hack Week. 2018, right? Okay, and then for some people that might have questions about like, but what if I wanna create a bucket where only certain people can access, um, or I wanna create a bucket that not everybody in this room can access, we will look through that in the console later. Um, but right now we want to sync this bucket with your own bucket. So basically copy the contents from this bucket to your own bucket. And so we would do AWS S3 sync, um, S3 dot slash slash ocean hack week. So it's syncing from the Ocean Hack Week 2018 bucket to your own S3 bucket. And you can enter. Oh my lord. Um, wow, it is really slow, I thought. Ah, you think it's the region thing? I think it might be a region thing. Huh? Right, but we're syncing from, because the bucket's in Ohio, right? I think it's a region thing. So in case you're wondering why it's so slow, it's because of the regions. Because the, o the Ocean Hack Week bucket is actually in the um, Oregon region, and your bucket is actually in the Ohio region. So there's some minor latency. If you've created buckets in the same region, they should transfer much faster. Um, so we're just gonna wait for a bit. Okay, um, is everybody's work completed? Great, excellent. So let's just list the contents of your bucket now.
Here we go. So if you list the contents of your bucket, you should see that it's been synced. You should have those two files. Um, I actually synced the wrong bucket. That's why it was taking really long, but regardless, um, you should have all these files there, right? ROP data and whale data. Okay, um, so again, so the, the other thing that would be good to know is that if you wanna get data from the, your bucket to the, the machine that you're working on, um, it's basically, we're not gonna go through the step in the interest of time, but it's basically, again, um, you can just sync, right? You can just use that same command. Um, and then just do a dot. So basically, it's Unix commands. That's how it works. Okay, yes? Good question. So in order to mount an S3 um, object storage to your computer, you would need to install something called S3 Fuse. But I would recommend not using S3 as a drive because S3 is for object storage. So the difference between an object storage and a file storage is that objects are a blob. They are one item. So what, it's not like a file where you can go in, make edits, and then it'll do it bit by bit. It's an entire chunk. So when you are doing processing, when you're writing and reading, it's slow. It's like Google Drive, but worse. Um, it's really slow because it can't go in and take out little bits, right? So when it makes a change, you have to make change the entire file, entire object. Okay, all right. So I would suggest not doing that. Um, when you provisioned your instance, you had a 25 gigabyte of disk space. That's something called EDS. That's like a solid state drive. So if you're working with data sets, you want to transfer your data sets to your drive and work with that. And then put it, either put it back in S3 so you don't have to have a big drive. You pay for that drive. It's 10 cents per gigabyte per month for that drive that you provision. But it is a solid state drive, so it's fast. Um, okay, does that answer, help answer your question? S3 is much cheaper to store your data on S3, and the even cheaper method than S3 is storing it in Glacier, which is the cold storage, right? So if you have data that's archived, you know, you don't need to access it, put it on Glacier, because it's a tenth of the S3 cost. Um, the other thing that I would like to bring up, um, because we're talking about drives now, is in Joe's demonstration yesterday, he was demonstrating opening NetCDF files. There are some cloud solutions to data storage now where you can actually put all these data files on S3, but it functions like reading files. It's something called a dot .zar, Z-A-R-R file, where it works exactly like NetCDF file, but you can read it directly off S3. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're looking to incorporate some cloud into your research. Okay. Um, and we won't do the sync thing, but essentially that's how it works. Um, so right now, the other thing that I wanna do really quickly um, so that we can all break for coffee, I know we all need it, um, is to go back to your console, your AWS console. Yeah. So does anyone have questions about instances, terminal, bash? Um, so if so if you're in your instance and you download the file and you just do a dot, right, it just downloads to the current directory that you're in. Yeah. It'll just count, download directly to the directory. Okay. So if you go back to your console, please locate your instance, okay? We're gonna create an image of your instance. So what an image is, is basically just a snapshot, right? A photograph of the current state of your instance. So remember that you've downloaded this raw data and whale data. So if you freeze this moment in time of your instance, when you launch it again from this snapshot of this frozen image, you would get that raw data and that whale data back. 
so in a use case, if you've installed you know, a bunch of um, programs, right? Like if you have your modeling data and you have your models all in there, if you freeze dry this and you stop your instance, the next time you spin it back up or you provision another instance, you can, cre you can provision an instance from this image, this snapshot that you created. And you don't have to go through the whole process of downloading your data, you don't have to go through the whole process of reinstalling your models. It will just come back. It's like camping food, right? It's like you, you suck out all the water, you stash it into your bag, and then into a bag, and then you pour some water on it and you get something back. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I apologize for all the cheesy analogies. Um, okay. So what we want to do here is we want to go to actions. So if you locate your instance, please go to actions. Um, don't terminate it yet. We're going to create an, inst uh, an image. We're going to go to image. And we're going to do create image. OK. And if you miss a step, um, this is all outlined in the notebooks that I put up um, on the GitHub. And what we want to do is just very quickly again, OHW Amanda uh, GitHub username. And then we want to say, for example, AMI for, right, OK. Right. OK. And then once you're done with that, you can just create an image. Right. So again, um, to walk through the step again, you want to locate your instance, go to actions, click on image, and then create an image. Um, and then once you do that, you should see a screen that looks something like this. And if you click on view pending AMI, I'm going to do it again. So actions, image, create image, click on it, fill it in with your um, OHW GitHub username. And then if you create an image, okay, um, because I've already created mine, so I get an error. Okay, so if you've gone through that step and you want to locate your AMI, on the left-hand side, you would see something called AMIs. Right, um, I see one being there. Uh, and if it's not showing up, just wait for a while because it takes some time for it to freeze dry. like a backup, exactly, yes. Okay, so if we hit refresh, and you'll see it's pending. Okay, what you want to do is wait until it turns green before you go on to the next step. And you can keep hitting refresh. It takes a while. So maybe we can take a 10 minute coffee break right now um, while we are waiting for this and then come back at 10 minutes because we're not done. Okay. Because you have to help me terminate your instances. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, I do not want to be the one doing that. Okay. 10 minutes and we'll be back. Uh, 10 42. Thank you. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to start. I. Okay. So we're going to restart again, um, just so that I don't eat into Valentina's time for the really interesting mining stuff. Um, Okay, so if you're back at this um, AMIs page, you would see a um, whole bunch of AMIs there. Um, and then please select your own AMI. So for example, this is mine. And if you click on launch, so find your own AMI. If you click on launch, 
you would be brought back to the same screen that we started out with, which is creating the instance, right? And now you can actually select any instance type that you want. Um, please don't select the GPUs. Um, but, and we're not actually gonna do this, uh, mostly because uh, we're, we're short on time. But for example, um, if you just wanna follow, if you just wanna s just view my screen, I can just demo this really quickly. I can actually just spin this up on, say, an instance like this, right? And I can go to configure instance. I can do the same thing that I did previously, which is select the um, IAM role. I can add storage. Um, and this is an instance that I selected that has a bunch of um, SSDs already attached to the instance for me. And I can add tags again, which I'm not gonna do. Um, and again, existing security group, right? And so the idea here is that once you have built that initial machine or that instance, you can create an image and then spin it back up anytime you want. Um, one of the things that I, oh, sorry. Okay, so you can do that. Um, but now we're gonna actually learn how to terminate instances because this would make my life really easy. Um, yes. Yes, good question. It does have a cost associated with it. It's something, um, it's the same price as storing an EBS volume, but it's half. So an EBS volume is the volume that you've attached to your um, instance. So in this case, it's 25 gigs. Um, and a snapshot will cost half that amount. Um, so it would, so it's 10 cents per gigabyte per month for an EBS volume, and it's five cents per gigabyte per month. So you don't want to create hundreds of AMIs. You just don't want to, because why would you, right? Um, if you have one, work with that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get out of this. And so that's how you relaunch an instance from an AMI. So if you go back to the EC2 dashboard, and please follow along with this step. Um, if you go back to the EC2 dashboard, and you click on running instances, please search for your own instance. Please don't terminate someone else's instance. Terminate your own, um, right? Um, if you select, so for example, like for me, is that? Ah, I've selected mine. You go to actions, instance state, and then terminate. Okay, so stopping means that your machine still sits there. You're getting charged for the drive that you've attached to your instance. So that doesn't go away. When you terminate, the drive and everything associated with it gets terminated. Caveat, if you have an extra volume that's been mounted, for example, a data drive, that doesn't get blown away. Only the root drive gets blown away. Um, okay, does that make sense? Yes, it gets like dismounted. Yes, and it gets, it sits there spinning. So it is a cost, yes, Rob. Yes, yep. So th there are little things that might cost your account to have runaway cost, right? Because you don't realize that. Um, okay, so just in our last five minutes, A, uh, are there questions? Questions, comments, compliments? No, okay. Um, all right, um, I just wanted to tie this back into um, research, right? Um, and how is that different from a machine that's sitting under your desk? A, it's actually not that much different. A virtual machine is a server that's sitting under your desk, except that you don't have to maintain it. Um, and some, of, some people have departmental clusters, right? Um, and sometimes departmental clusters can be hard to get on because if there are multiple people using it, either you have to wait or um, you just don't, it just doesn't run fast enough for you. And so these are use cases of why you might move to the cloud because you have access to all these machines. And also the other thing is for collaboration. If you have a freeze-dried machine, an AMI, you can very easily share it with a collaborator who can build that same machine that you have. And again, we looked at storage. Um, so like S3 is a good way to store big data sets. Um, 
Amazon has a bunch of satellite data up to petabytes that they're storing on S3 that if you have an AWS account, you can easily just sync your buckets, download what you want. Um, and so those are, are really good use cases for the cloud. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think those uh, um, Amazon Earth data um, are free if you have an AWS account. So transfer between S3 buckets is free. That's, that's how they lock you in. Um, if you transfer out from the S3 bucket, so it goes over the internet into somebody else's rate drive or somebody else's thumb drive, you get charged for it. Okay? So it's something good to keep in mind. Um, the, the last comment I want to make is that, do I have any last comment? I think, I think I'm done. I don't have any more comments. Um, oh, 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 yeah, I have last comments. Um, there are lots of services also, other than compute and storage, that you can use the cloud for. And that's also one of the reasons why you would consider moving to the cloud. So for example, databases, it's managed. Anyone that's deal with, dealt with databases know how hard it is to maintain and manage, and the cloud providers provide a kind of service. There are also things like um, serverless computing, where you actually do not have to go through the step of provisioning your instance, and you can just run code as a service. Um, so if you want to know more, if you have more questions, um, there's always Rob and I, or you can email us, Slack. Um, and I think we're done. Thank you.